Good morning and welcome to Coffee with Sister Jacinta. And this morning, um, we're continuing our spiritual journey through the Catechism of the Catholic Church. In the evening last uh, night, I was given a little text from someone who had read the officer reading. And the second reading um, was a reflection that was so beautiful. And I hadn't read it because yesterday was also the feast of St. Angela Marici. And I had read her reading from my second reading. Um, but this little um, snippet that was shared, I think I'm just going to use it as an opening prayer, even though it's more of a meditation. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. My merit comes from his mercy, for I do not lack merit so long as he does not lack pity. And if the Lord's mercies are many, then I am rich in merits. For even if I am aware of many sins, what does it matter? Where sin abounded, grace has overflowed. And if the Lord's mercies are from all ages forever, I too will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. Will I not sing of my own righteousness? No. Lord, I shall be mindful only of your justice. Yet that too is my own, for God has made you my righteousness. So Lord, we ask that we might be able to dive into that truth. Um, again, it sort of um, lends itself to yesterday's lesson about accepting your forgiveness, um, that we can then um, give forgiveness and, and putting that all our past then into your heart, which is a burning furnace. We trust in you, O oh Jesus, and guide us through this class. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. That was just so beautiful. So I was so glad that someone had read the actual reading for the day. <laughs> so yesterday, um, we concluded um, a section that was specially devoted to the working of the Holy Spirit. And we're now going to look at the part of the creed where we um, read, I believe in the Holy Catholic Church. This is going to be paragraph four, uh, 748, if you're following along in your catechism. Christ is the light of humanity, and it is, accordingly, the heartfelt desire of this sacred council being gathered together in the Holy Spirit, that by proclaiming his gospel to every creature, it may bring to all men that light of Christ, which shines out visibly from the church. These words open the Second Vatican Council's dogmatic constitution of the church. By choosing this starting point, the council demonstrates that the article of faith about the church depends entirely on the articles concerning Christ Jesus. The church has no other light than Christ. According to a favorite image of the church fathers, the church is like the moon. All its light is reflected from the sun. Okay, and, and that is so beautiful. And that's, again, the church is likened to Mary. Okay, and Mary is often, again, pictured as the moon. So realizing that all our light, all our beauty, all our goodness comes from God. It's sort of like that opening reading, okay? All my merits are from him. Um, and yet I, I can rejoice then because, you know, his, um, like where evil abounds, grace abounds all the more. And by the, by the fact of the moon, I have to say this morning, if you got to look outside, it was gorgeous. We had a full moon out there and the clouds were whispering past and um, just so bright. Uh, so um, again, that whole idea of, you know, it's radiance and its ability to give us so much light in the dark um, and yet none of it is its own. And, and this is the, the story of St. John the Baptist. You know, people got so confused. Was he the prophet? You know, was he the Messiah? Was he the light? And he's like, no, no, no. You know, I'm just bearing his light. Okay. Um, as one of the um, fathers of the church said, you know, he was the word, okay, uh, or the voice, okay, the word was Christ, okay, so his voice gave us the word, and then it disappears, okay, um, it's nothing without that, you know, that word, okay, it's just the instrument, and so um, we get to be that instrument of God, okay, by allowing God's light to be reflected in us, and to dwell in us. Article 749, the article concerning the church also depends entirely on the article about the Holy Spirit, which immediately precedes it. Indeed, having shown that the spirit is the source and giver of all holiness, we now confess that it is he 
who has endowed the church with holiness. The church is in a phrase used by the fathers, the place where the spirit flourishes. And, you know, again, we, we continually ask God to fan that flame in each of our hearts um, because, you know, sometimes the church can seem almost dead and, um, you know, and we're that church, you know, and I, I love St. Paul again today. I, I thought, wow, I, a second time. Oh, no, all right. It's a letter to the Hebrews. And some people say, maybe it's not St. Paul. I think it's St. Paul, but it's how you talk about rouse yourself. Okay. Again. All right. So you realize he was continually having to fan that flame. Okay. To be alive and active to be able to grasp the full meaning of God's love and mercy in his life. 750, to believe that the church is holy and Catholic and that she is one and apostolic, as the Nicene Creed adds, is inseparable from belief in God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's incredible. Okay, that, listen to that statement there, okay? To believe that the church is holy and Catholic and that she's one and apostolic as the Nicene Creed adds, is inseparable from belief in God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's amazing, okay? So we don't have this choice, okay? You know, sometimes we have um, this idea of cafeteria being cafeteria Catholic, we use that term, okay? Picking and choosing what I'm going to believe. And the church is putting them on par, okay? Just as I believe in the Trinity, I must believe in the church okay, being holy, Catholic, apostolic, okay, um, I'm missing one of them, one, okay, <laughs> but anyway, um, so those marks of the church, and we're going to go over those, I'm, I'm pretty certain, okay, I, I don't sometimes read ahead, but we'll look at this as we go, um, and I lose my place every time I do that, but not to worry, it's all in front of me, so, okay, in the Apostles' Creed, we profess one holy church, credo ecclesium, and not to believe in the church so as not to confuse God with his works and to attribute clearly to God's goodness all the gifts he has bestowed on his church. Okay. Um, let's go to paragraph one. The church in God's plan. Names and images of the church. The word church, in parentheses, they read Latin, ecclesia, from the Greek, ekklein, uh, to call out of means a, convo convo a convocation. Okay, um, I'm expanding my vocabulary here. Okay, a convocation. Okay, think about a group calling, okay, um, or an assembly. It designates the assemblies of the people usually for a religious purpose. Ecclesia is used frequently in the Greek Old Testament for the assembly of the chosen people before God. Above all, their assembly on Mount Sinai where Israel received the law and was established by God as his holy people. By calling itself church, the first community of Christian believers recognized itself as the heir to that assembly. In the church, God is calling together his people from all the ends of the earth. The equivalent Greek term, Kyriak, from which the English word church and the German kirche are derived, means what belongs to the Lord. And, you know, I, it's sometimes just the beauty of it, okay, that it's an assembly, that they're the people of God, you know, that you go all the way back to that Old Testament and they're all gathered. And, um, and God wants them to be his people. And, and he wants that oneness, that there's, um, there's a mark, okay, not just in the flesh, okay, but on the way in which you behave and the way in which you make decisions. And, um, and this is something that, again, I know I mentioned before, like, you know, but if someone would see us, would they know that we're Catholic by the way in which we act, by the decisions that we make, by uh, the intensity with which we live in this world? Do we live in it the way St. Paul urges us to, you know, to, um, to buy as if you weren't having possessions, you know? to be um, um, among, um, like even being married as if not married, okay? Uh, not in a sense like, you know, disdaining it, but not being attached to it, not finding it as an end, okay? God's our end, God's our purpose, he's our drive. Everything else is in means, okay? It can't take God's place. So is this, you know, evident in the way in which if someone could dive into your thoughts, okay? 
where are our thoughts? You know, are they about getting ahead? Um, or are they full of, you know, thinking of others and trust and, and, and then putting before God, you know, the confusion and for ourselves, but also for our brothers, okay, or the struggles and lifting them up. So we truly want to be that assembly of God, okay, that people, okay, they call us his people, okay, it's like calling us his child, calling him, this is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. And we want him to be God, the father, to be able to look at each of us like that. Paragraph 752. In Christian usage, the word church designates the liturgical assembly, but also the local community or the whole universal community of believers. These three meanings are inseparable. Okay, so you've got three ways of looking at it. A local community, the whole universal community of believers, or the liturgical assembly. The church is the people that God gathers in the whole world. She exists in local communities and is made real in a liturgical, above all, a Eucharistic assembly. She draws her life from the word and the body of Christ, and so herself becomes Christ's body. All right, and um, you know, so we have Christ as being the head of the church. Okay, he allows himself to be one of us. This, again, is so profound, and that's why um, the Mass is the paramount, okay, um, of, of coming again as a community, as coming together as a church, especially if we are able to completely encounter him by listening to his word, by uniting ourselves to a sacrifice, and by receiving him, because he's larger than us. We're actually being received by him, and, um, and, and so we become that one, truly that one body, okay? This is why it marriage, you know, from the earliest time, um, you know, they, the marriage couple is allowed into the sanctuary, okay? Um, and, and that whole idea, that unit, that, that that's a symbolism, okay, of um, their oneness, okay, in that reception of the body, okay, of Christ, they, they become one body. Um, and, and this is what Christ wants of us, we're, we're to be that united and to do all that we can to get rid of these divisions. Symbols of the church, paragraph 753, right? We have a lot of symbols for the Holy Spirit. So we'll have to see who wins, okay? The church or the Holy Spirit. <laughs> um, in scripture, we find a host of interrelated images and the figures through which Revelation speaks of the inexhaustible mystery of the church. The images taken from the Old Testament are variations on a profound theme, the people of God. In the New Testament, all these images find a new center because Christ has become the head of his people, which henceforth is his body. Around this center are grouped images taken from the life of the shepherd or from cultivation of the land, from the art of building, or from the family life of marriage. 754 reads, the church is accordingly a sheepfold, the sole and necessary gateway to which is Christ. It's also the flock of which God himself foretold that he would be the shepherd and whose sheep, even though governed by human shepherds, are unfailingly nourished and led by Christ himself, the good shepherd, the prince of shepherds, who gave his life for his sheep. Okay, so we have that whole sheepfold. And this is what we need to pray for those who are, okay, to be the human shepherds, to lead us. Um, you know, in the Old Testament, you hear our Lord weep over the fact that some of the shepherds, you know, have grown, um, what do you want to call it? Uh, they, they've stayed strong. Maybe they've you know, grown fat, okay? <laughs> Whatever the word was that he uses. Okay, while his sheep, you know, gone, um, they're going lean, okay, and they're, they're lost, and they have no one to guide them, and, um, and so we have such a great responsibility to pray, okay, for our, our shepherds. Uh, I love to think about them, especially when I'm praying my rosary, and I get to the um, ascension, because our Lord is leaving his flock, his sheepfold, his church, in the hands now of the apostles, okay? And, um, you know, and I think, wow, that's just, you know, with all their human strength, but all their human weakness and all their little intricacies, where you call those things, okay? Um, 
And you know, that's, um, it, it's an amazing moment. And so I think how necessary it is for us to pray for them, helping them, you know, th through our prayers and sacrifice. And, you know, and because they have such a, a, an accounting before God, so much is entrusted to them. Okay, so 755, the church is a cultivated field, the tillage of God. On that land, the ancient olive tree grows, whose holy roots were the prophet and in which the reconciliation of the Jews and Gentiles has been brought about and will be brought about again. Okay, so it's a cultivated field. That land, like a choice vineyard, has been planted by the heavenly cultivator. Yet the true vine is Christ, who gives life and fruitfulness to the branches, that is, to us, who through the church remain in Christ, without whom we can do nothing. And, you know, so that job, okay, um, of those who are to take his place here on earth, he's the heavenly cultivator. But he, again, he entrusts that cultivation to his shepherds. Um, and now they're going to be, you know, growers of the ground, okay, the cultivators, okay, of the ground, the farmers. Um, so uh, we have to do our best, okay, to uh, blossom and allow the, the sheep, the shepherds, okay, even to see where is their growth, where is this budding forth, so they can actually recognize the good soil, if indeed they have been blinded. Because, um, you know, again, we're working in a world where we, we, we all can fall, you know, um, St. Augustine, you know, he would get so overwhelmed, overwhelmed because he knew he was a sheep, but also a shepherd, okay? And, and this is true for, for all of us, okay? And uh, so we can't be out to condemn, okay? We have to be out more than anything else to assist each other towards the getting to heaven. Um, we're not in a competition. We're not in a blame game. We're, we're in this all to, to bring all of us to, the, to bring glory to God. Number 756 reads, often too, the church is called the building of God. The Lord compared himself to the stone which the builders rejected, but which was made into the cornerstone. On this foundation, the church is built by the apostles and from it, the church receives solidity and unity. And just stopping there, okay, you don't forget, here is the cornerstone. He's the stone rejected, okay? can't be afraid of also encountering the same okay we're, we're called to be that unity that we're that one we can't let, let one person experience it and not the rest okay christ allows us that dignity of sharing in all that he undertook okay so if he could be disdained if he could be rejected we can't be surprised that we get rejected i was listening yesterday um and these were just doctors who were trying to testify just to honesty, honesty in the medical field. And two of them lost their jobs. They're probably more than that, but the two that I was aware of. But what I thought was interesting is in both cases, God was so beautiful because the two of them both expressed the same feeling of all of a sudden like this, this joy. I mean, they had a family to worry about. Okay, a livelihood that was taken away from them. And yet God overwhelmed them with a sense of joy and not willing to not testify to the truth okay you got that <laughs> okay you know saying all like these backward words okay but you know by testifying to the truth <laughs> you know there was this joy there was this freedom okay and yet they're rejected okay and they have consequences but god can't be out on generosity and um so even though you know they may have a real rough road still way ahead of them okay we lift them up in prayer and how many of our brothers and sisters who are in that same predicament throughout the world um, but we realize that God is consistent, okay? As he upheld his son, even though it looked like he had been defeated and he's buried in the ground, three days later, okay, he rises. And so we may look like we're conquered. We may look like we're the fool, okay? Um, but again, if, the, if that rock, which is rejected, is the cornerstone, okay? Don't be afraid, okay? Seek the truth and stay with the truth. This edifice has been named has many names to describe it. The house of God in which his family dwells, the household of God in the spirit, the dwelling place of God among men, and especially the holy temple. This temple symbolizes in places of worship built out of stone, is praised by the fathers, and not without reason, 
in compared to the liturgy of the Holy City, the New Jerusalem. As living stones, we here on earth are built into it. It is this holy city that is seen by John as it comes down out of heaven from God when the world is made anew and prepared like a bride adorned for her husband. Okay, again, so beautiful when you think about this adornment, okay, um, you know, and you know, again, I, sometimes I never really appreciated all that kind of stuff. I just never, I guess that kind of stuff, maybe glitter sometimes attracts me. <laughs> Okay, but you know, I like, okay, I like little things that like shine. Okay, but um, truly that beauty, okay, that you see in gems and in gold and um, in, in clear, clean, like glass, okay, that truly um, it reflects, okay. Um, it, it really struck me when I went over to Poland one time and I got to go to a castle in Warsaw. I don't think it ever hit me until then how you can get enamored by this. But when you think about this is this is us, okay, um, as far as we're working with virtues and, and honesty and, you know, there's this brilliance and this beauty and God wants us to be adorned. But I also like the fact that he mentioned about a temple, okay. Uh, St. Paul loves talking about us being, you know, uh, living stones in the temple. And what's a temple for? But for the glory of God. Okay, and again, we're made to give glory to God. If you read the beginning of Ephesians, that's what our call is, okay? Um, so uh, again, it keeps us grounded, okay, and uh, focused. And there's all kinds of different ways that just sort of motivate us. And so this is the one thing that when you get these different titles, just go with the one that really gets you. Like a lot of people love the good shepherd, okay, and being a sheep and being carried in his arms. My little Jacinta, whom I'm named after, um, that was one of her favorite pictures. And so when they actually had sheep one time, Lucia's looking at her like, what are you doing? <laughs> she's in the middle of all the sheep and she found a little baby one. She's holding on to it. She goes, it's like a picture <laughs> of, of Jesus, okay, with all the sheep and, and holding the little lamb. And um, so it, it's just such a sweet thing, okay. But something that really helps us to have that, um, that image, okay, and then trying to live it out in our, our own personal lives. Number 757, the church further, which is called that Jerusalem, which is above, and our mother is described as the spotless spouse um, of the spotless lamb. It is she whom Christ loved and for whom he delivered himself up, that he might sanctify her. It is she who is united, who unites to himself by an unbreakable alliance and whom he constantly nourishes and cherishes. Okay, so the church further, which is called the Jerusalem, which is above, is our mother. Okay, and it is described as the spotless spouse, the spotless lamb. Okay, and that's, again, so beautiful because we know that that spotless lamb is Christ, but he is sharing that with us. Okay, he wishes all our blemishes, okay, all our defects to be completely washed away and, and that wholeness, okay, to be restored, okay, through his precious blood. And uh, this is something, again, we keep on trusting in, okay, like that reading I said at the very beginning of today, um, where, you know, if, if God is his mercy and his pity remains, then I'm full of the riches of his mercy. And that's just such a, a beautiful uh, way of moving and walking in faith. And it's not dependent on us, okay? Like we can't earn heaven. And that's the thing. Don't be afraid of any of your past mistakes or even your present mistakes. Hand them over, hand over your weaknesses, allow God to be your strength. It's, it's when we acknowledge it, okay, that's what St. Paul noticed. You know, when he wanted to wiggle away and just be, you know, freed of certain weaknesses, whatever it was, and our Lord said, no, in weakness is where you'll find strength. And because then it, it doesn't rely on Paul, it doesn't rely on me, it doesn't rely on you, it relies on Christ. And, uh, and that's that poverty. And then we're strong. Um, okay. Our next title says the church's origin, foundation, and mission. Paragraph 758, we begin our investigation of the church's mystery by meditating on her origin in the Holy Trinity's plan and her progressive realization in history. A plan born in the Father's heart. The eternal father, in accordance with the utterly gratuitous and mysterious design of his wisdom and goodness, created the whole universe and chose to raise up men to share in his own divine life, to which he calls all men 
in his son. The father determined to call together in a holy church those who should believe in Christ. This family of God, okay, another name again for the church, is gradually formed and takes shape during the stages of human history in keeping with the father's plan. In fact, already present in figure at the beginning of the world, this church was prepared in marvelous fashion in the history of the people of Israel and the old alliance established in this last age of the world and made manifest in the outpouring of the spirit. It will be brought to glorious completion at the end of time. So this is, okay, our history. You know, we are being formed in the Old Testament. We are being continued, okay, to be um, renewed and strengthened and healed in this present life. And we will, okay, all, you know, be able to see that glorious completion, which is prefigured, okay, even in the book of Revelation. The church foreshadowed from the world's beginning. Christians of the first century said, the world was created for the sake of the church. Hmm. God created the world for the sake of communion with his divine life, a communion brought about by the convocation of men in Christ. And this convocation is the church. The church is the goal of all things. And God permitted such painful upheavals as the angels fall and man sins only as occasions and means for displaying all the power of his arm and the whole measure of the love he wanted to give the world. Just as God wills, God's will is creation and it's called the world. So his intentions is the salvation of men and it's called the church. Okay, that is um, an amazing statement, okay? That the world was created for the sake of the church. And again, we know that we say church, we're not talking about a building, okay? Uh, we're talking about a people of God and a people of God that's saved, a people of God who has experienced salvation. And, you know, it, it, the whole creation was created for that. This is so profound. This is so beautiful. Um, it reminds me of a conversation I had one time with my mom. And we were just thinking about, you know, well, first of all, you get so caught up, especially we would walk at nighttime. We had a a huge uh, German shepherd and we would walk at night. So we felt very safe around 11 o'clock at night. And, you know, sometimes the stars were out and just the vastness of the, um, the world that God made. And, you know, sometimes you know, people would think, you know, well, maybe there's creatures that God made that we don't even know about, you know, and could he? Absolutely. There's no reason why he couldn't. And, and may he have, he's, he may have, okay. We may still learn to, to discover that. But my mom was like, and what if not? Like, isn't it amazing to think that he can make all of this just for us? And, you know, and we do know that all salvation, okay, no matter if there are other creatures on other planets, okay, was wrought by him coming on earth as a man and suffering and dying, okay, and rising for us. Uh, you know, it, it, it's, um, it's implicit implications okay are are universal okay they're not just you know just for the earth okay the ramifications are are extended everywhere um so it is something for us just sometimes to ponder and to be grateful for and again to cooperate with and again to remember to pray to pray so that god can truly receive glory in all of the members of his church because he came to save all. We don't want his blood to be shed in vain. This is the greatest tragedy. And so um, this is the reason why, you know, St. Paul says, I'm making up what's lacking in the suffering of Christ. Okay, for those who are saying no, St. Paul would say yes. For those who were sinning, he would renounce himself. He would be able to offer the different hardships that he underwent, the whippings, the, the scourgings, the, the stonings, the being shipwrecked, um, you know, uh, many times having nothing to eat, other times maybe doing well, um, but all for the sake of God and his church. And, and so this is what we also are called to do. So I thank you for joining me today. And um, we'll close today with a glory be to the Trinity. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 
Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. To the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you. God bless you.